Now, on to the combat demonstration. Uh, I haven't done one of these in a while, and I enjoy doing them. And unlike my previous combat demonstrations, this is not to show uh, a, an example of good tactics. It's going to be tailored to explaining the rules, uh, as many rules as possible, and their interactions with each other in a memorable way. So I want to preface it with that. Also, it's going to be slow in places compared to actual play, just for the sake of thoroughness and teaching. Uh, actual play, you're not going to need to always know when someone is uh, concealed or hidden at every point and declare it to the table. That obviously is just to uh, go through this uh, teaching exercise. So we have a level six party here, and it's a conventional, our classic party of a fighter, a cleric, a wizard, and a rogue. And they have been uh, going into this crypt, and they're now encountering the boss of the dungeon, which is a necromancer that has as two grunts, two uh, zombie brutes, two giant zombie brutes, a troll, and also an archer um, who is his his um, uh, assistant who's going to be trying to hide behind this pillar. Pathfinder 2E lets us make a challenging yet fair encounter very easily using the encounter building system. For a level 6 party, uh, this is this level 6 necromancer is 40 XP, this level 5 archer is 30 XP, this level 5 troll is 30 XP, and the zombie brutes are 10 XP each, so equaling 120 XP. Okay, so the party walks in, and specifically the rogue and the archer are trying to avoid notice. And so uh, they rolled their stealth checks early on and have succeeded at staying unnoticed to the other side. And when the other party members walk in, the cleric has a the light spell cast on one of his sling stones, and so is able to project outward uh, 20 feet of bright light and 20 feet of dim light beyond that. And so that's all that the fighter, who is a human, is able to see. And in from the darkness, this necromancer can see them clearly because the light source is on the cleric. Um, and he is a human, the necromancer is, and he starts in his villain speech. Um, and the rogue decides to interrupt this villain speech. So the rogue is now the, rogue is now the instigator. And at this point, um, we will roll initiative uh, for all of the creatures and uh, see what order they will act. Now, the rogue is unnoticed and note there is no surprise round and there's no treating some creatures as surprised in pathfinder 2e the way there is in 5e and we'll see how the rogue hiding is going to be um treated by the system so they all roll initiative and by default creatures roll perception for initiative and in this case it makes sense because they're all perceiving uh to different degrees that someone's about to start a fight uh, however, because r the rogue and the archer were avoiding notice, they will roll stealth for initiative instead of perception. Pathfinder lets the GM decide um, what skill checks are appropriate. Okay, so the rogue wins initiative. Let me first explain what would happen if an enemy uh, would, let's say the necromancer rolls higher than the rogue in initiative. Different GMs do deal with this differently, but uh, since uh, it was pretty clear the rogue was the instigator, uh, in this case, I would make it so that the necromancer knows that this rogue is about to do something. And although they didn't perceive them previously, they heard some telltale sign or maybe observed the rogue um, about to walk out. And this rogue would probably become hidden to this necromancer immediately. And the necromancer would have the option of taking their turn of three actions now uh, to prepare for this combat, or maybe just delay their turn. Okay, so we uh, start with the rogue, and let me just explain an alternate scenario first. 
let's say that this room is not dark and let's say that the rogue is not relying on the cleric's torch. So assuming the room is brightly lit, when the rogue steps out, it will, the she will see everybody clearly because none of them were trying to avoid notice or stealth uh, at the time this combat broke out. However, uh, the archer was. And in that case, because the archer succeeded on their stealth roll, the rogue, uh, the, the archer is unnoticed by the rogue. So she and the rest of the party do not know it's there. Now, if the archer had failed their stealth roll, uh, what would happen? Uh, I think we would refer to the degrees of success for the sneak action. A failure means that they some sound is made, some telltale sign of their presence is, uh, gives away their position. And this archer would be hidden to the rogue at the start of combat. If they critically failed on their stealth check, um, then this person would be observed by the rogue if the room, room were brightly lit, while possibly benefiting from cover. Okay. But we have a situation where the room is dark before the cleric walks in. This human necromancer likes to live in the dark, let's just say. And uh, so uh, the rogue starts their turn. She's going to stride out. She is an elf, so she has a great speed of 35 feet, and she walks out. How? Ugh. So back to our darkened room, we have the rogue, uh, who is an elf and does not have dark vision. She only has low light vision. So she's not able to see beyond the radius of what the torch illuminates. So as she's walking out with her excellent 35 foot speed, because she's an elf with the fleet feet, she, this is as far as she gets with her first action. And she does not observe any enemies. However, she was watching, or not, not watching, she was listening to the villain giving his speech. So this villain is actually hidden to her and she could attack the square. Also a GM might rule that he remains undetected. That's completely fair because of uh, the distance. And, uh, but we at least we have clear terminology. And so she knows what square it's in, but will have a 50-50 chance of missing if she were to attack that square. Uh, but she wants to know what else is in the room. So what she'll do is uh, she's going to do the seek action at this point against um, in this cone. Oh, meanwhile, um, all of these creatures have not been trying to avoid notice. So she heard some indication that they exist. So she notices them. However, she's not sure where they are. Um, they are undetected to her. This hobgoblin archer succeeded on its stealth check so is unnoticed and undetected by her all right she does the seek check and she's going to do a perception check against their stealth dcs that's not very good she has a 16 however uh these creatures are not very good at stealth at all and so she succeeds against their stealth dcs so they now uh, become hidden to her, uh, and she's also aware of where the necromancer is. All right, so she senses these creatures are here, and not only that, that they're quite large, and so they're probably going to rush up against her. So she wants to attack one of these creatures. She's going to attack the one in the middle, which we know is a troll. Now, um, she's a rogue and wants to get her sneak attack damage, so an enemy would need to be flat-footed to her for her to get that sneak attack damage. And for non-rogues, you generally want an enemy to be flat-footed so that they are easier to hit. The problem here, though, is that she walked out in the open and uh, is therefore observed by the troll. She did not sneak out, which she was too far away to do so. A sneaking would have been at half speed. And she just uh, strode out at her full speed. So in most situations, uh, for most characters, um, this troll would no longer be flat-footed to her. However, in this case, it is because she's a rogue and rogues spring into combat faster than foes can react. Basically, 
when they roll stealth for initiative or deception for initiative, where they were hiding behind something or they were in a conversation, a social situation, and spring into combat, in that situation, they can catch people um, flat-footed if they have not yet acted during the combat. Because this troll has not yet acted during combat, it is flat-footed to her, even though she has revealed herself. Specific beats general. Now note, she cannot see the troll, and so she still has the disadvantage of uh, having a 50-50 mischance. But the troll is flat-footed to her. We have two uh, rules interacting um, that combine to have a different, you know, well, that are interacting. So she is going to now throw this dagger, which she did not have in her hand at the start of combat. Taking out a weapon normally takes an action, but as a rogue, she has the level two quick draw feat where you can interact to draw a weapon and strike with it. She, with one fluid motion, takes out her weapon and she throws the knife, uh, throws the dagger at the troll, but it is hidden to her. So she has to roll a flat check and try to get 11 or higher to possibly hit the troll. And she succeeded. So she succeeds against the troll and now does a normal attack roll and it is flat footed to her. So it has a minus two armor class and she's going to throw this dagger. A 21 succeeds and will do damage and she gets her extra 2d6 sneak attack damage on the roll. And that's 14 damage to the troll. So next we move to the troll in initiative. And the troll has, um, everyone's been lit very clearly by the cleric's torch and also the troll has dark vision. So no problem in perceiving this elf that just ran up. Oh, its turn has started and trolls have regeneration. So it heals 15 health at the start, no, 20 health at the start of every turn and comes back completely uh, healed from that dagger wound. It also has a 10 foot reach, so it runs up here. It will now try to bite the rogue, and the rogue, every creature has one reaction per turn, and this rogue has the level one feat called Nimble Dodge. As a reaction, when she's targeted by an attack, she gets to uh, nimbly dodge and get a plus two circumstance bonus to her AC, so it goes up from 24 to 26. But this troll is a scary brute and has a plus 14 bonus to its attack. Let's see what happens. A 25. So she barely uh, avoids it because of her nimble dodge reaction. It now follows up as its third action. Monsters can attack more than once because of the three action economy. Um, but it's less accurate. Uh, the multiple attack penalty serves to make every subsequent attack after the first uh, more and more inaccurate. So it's only a plus 10 bonus this time. And oh, this is a natural 20. Okay, so a 30 um, makes it a hit, but the natural 20 makes it go one step higher in the four degrees of success from a success to a critical success. And so it will do double damage on this claw. And, oh, not a very good roll for damage. So it does 14 damage uh, to the rogue. Okay, from past experience, the party knows that trolls have attacks of opportunity. Not every creature does. And so if he were to simply walk up to the troll, because the troll has a 10 foot reach and he would be walking out of a square that it threatens, that it would provoke a free attack by the troll. He wants to avoid that. So he is going to stride up to here and then do the step action, only moving five feet, but has the advantage of not provoking reactions based on uh, movement. So uh, with his third action, he is now going to attack the troll, which is now lit by the cleric. However, it is within the dim light radius of the cleric's torch. It is not showing very clearly at all here, but it's 20 feet of bright light and 20 more feet of dim light. So he has to roll a flat check of five or higher to succeed in targeting this troll. And he succeeds on that check. 
And then he's going to now strike with his longsword. Fighters are very accurate in this edition, so it's a plus 17. A 26 succeeds at slicing the troll, and it's going to do a total of 18 damage to the troll, which will get regenerated soon unless they do something about it. Next, we have the cleric, and he is a dwarf. And so he has dark vision. He's able to see this whole room. He's able to see, observe all of these creatures here. However, uh, the archer is uh, unnoticed by him. And he walks forward. He wants to help out. And he is going to move right here um, because he's about to cast a spell. And if he were to cast that spell from here, it would provoke an attack of opportunity from the troll. He doesn't want to do that. He's going to move right here. And being a cleric with the Sun Domain, he has a special focus spell uh, that he can uh, cast. Focus spells cost a focus point, and he has one focus point that he can rest 10 minutes outside of combat to get back. And his special spell is called Dazzling Flash, which um, creates a bright flash. It's like a, uh, what are those called? It's like a flash bomb and has a chance of dazzling and possibly blinding creatures temporarily. So um, the number that they need to succeed on their saving throw is 22. So they need to make a fortitude saving throw. This, by the way, uses the cleric's last two actions. Most spells take two actions or more. Okay, the troll is going to make this fortitude save. Um, 12 plus 17 is a 29. It succeeds on its roll, and it's not a critical success. So what this means is that it will be dazzled for one round. I did not go over this before, but the dazzled condition means that all creatures are concealed to it. The zombie brute, meanwhile, will try to avoid this effect and rolls a 14, so it fails on its roll. This means the creature is blinded for one round and dazzled for one minute. When it's blinded, everything becomes hidden to it. And the creature can spend an interact action rubbing its eyes to remove, to end the blinded condition. Thankfully, the, um, as we can tell from the fighter's point of view, the cleric has also illuminated these enemies in the middle of the room. Okay, next is the wizard. And on his turn, he was going to cast Fireball on all of those enemies. And Fireball, he also knows from past experience, will do fire damage to the troll, which will prevent its regeneration from happening. So uh, we're going to get a cool effect in a second. Um, but here's the area that he will choose. He's going to do a fireball in this 20 foot radius circle and we're also going to have this cool effect okay and uh they all well he rolls damage first it's going to be uh 6d6 let's put fireball out there 6d6 damage so 17 base fire damage and the troll well, let's do that one last. The zombie brutes uh, have very poor reflex saves, being lower level and being zombies. Well, a 21 is quite good. However, the DC for the wizard is 22. So witness the power of attacking lower level creatures with area effect spells and other, and other things. Um, it fails on its save. It takes a full 17 damage. This zombie brute will also try to avoid the fireball. And with a total of five, it is 10 or more less than the target number. So it's a critical failure for this blind zombie. It's going to uh, take double damage. So 34 dump damage for the zombie. And the troll is now going to try to save and also rolls poorly and takes 17 damage, but it has a weakness to fire, weakness 10 to fire. So if it takes any fire damage, it takes that additional number in damage. So it's going to take 27 fire damage. And also um, that will pause its regeneration. I'm going to have this little animation. Um, so I remember 
its regeneration is going to be uh, not triggered at the start of its next turn. Oh, and the Necromancer also tries to avoid the effect. He's level 6, so has a high, probably a better save. And 13 plus 14, 27, he takes half damage uh, from the fireball. Oh, and he also had false life cast, just like any good necromancer should. So that only took away from his temporary hit points of two. I mean, of ten. <laughs> okay, next is the zombie brute. Uh, this zombie brute. All right, uh, it's going to... Let me get this fireball radius out of the way. The zombie brute will uh, move here. Um, well, first of all, zombies are uh, have the permanent slowed one condition. So when their turn starts, instead of gaining three actions, they gain only two actions uh, for their turn. It's going to move here. It's going to stride here. Um, but because it's leaving a square that the fighter threatens, and fighters have attack of opportunity, the fighter will have a free attack. He's going to use his reaction um, to try to attack this zombie. And it is also, there's bright light on it right now, so he had to didn't have to worry about targeting it. And a natural one is rolled. Uh, that is not good for the fighter. And the zombie will now try to hit the fighter with its fist attack. Yeah, uh, 16 will not hit. Okay, so the necromancer is next. So seeing his villain speech interrupted, he is mad. And he is going to, he, he knows that the zombie, the troll, and the troll have dark vision, and so does his secret friend, the archer. And so he's going to cast darkness over this melee in the middle, and also hope to um, block this wizard's line of sight. Uh, so he will cast darkness, which is a stationary 20-foot circle, and uh, do it right here. And uh, so... Basically, the moment that happens, all of these creatures become hidden to the fighter and the rogue and the wizard um, once he casts the spell. And these creatures have dark vision and they still observe them. All right, the next thing the necromancer will do is now try to give guidance to this zombie brute. It's a cantrip, one action, to give the zombie brute plus one status bonus on an upcoming check of its choice. So that's the Necromancer's turn. Okay, now it's the zombie's turn, and those of you with keen eyes will note that it moved a little farther south, uh, but uh, you'll see why in a second. So the zombie, we remember, uh, has uh, was blinded by the cleric and will be dazzled for a minute. It's blind for one round only. It could rub its eyes to remove the blind condition, but it only has two actions, and it wants to just go after that cleric. It's also kind of stupid. It has no mind. And um, it will just charge towards the cleric. Um, just to note, they became hidden to the zombie when it got blinded. And so it still knows where they are. So it's going to walk towards the cleric. However, when it's blind, so it treats movement as difficult terrain, which means that every five feet of movement costs plus five. So this is as far as it can get. It cannot reach the dwarf. Okay, so it's gonna attack that hidden rogue instead with its last action. And the rogue, uh, it cannot see the rogue, so it's gonna have to do that 50-50 flat check. But we remember that there's now darkness over this area. So the rogue does not see the zombie attacking it. In 5e, this would just cancel each other out. There'd be no game effect. But there's still an effect. The rogue is going to be flat-footed to the zombie. So the zombie, if it can succeed on its 50-50 um, check, will have the benefit of having an, a rogue with minus 2 to AC. And my keen-eyed followers will know that I'm uh, forgetting an ability, which is that the rogue has... Deny advantage. Level 3 rogues and higher can deny advantage and uh, are not flat-footed to enemies that are undetected or hidden to them. So we have an interaction here of uh, these clear terms um, uh, can now be referred to other abilities, and there's no ambiguity at all as to when they apply. Okay, so 
it is not flat she is not flat footed to the zombie and the zombie attempts to target it needs 11 or higher on this roll does not succeed so i'm not going to bother with the attack roll it um now ceases to be blinded and remains dazzled okay I spent some time tinkering with the lighting settings to try to convey that uh, there's bright light nearer to the cleric and dim light beyond. So the next uh, uh, actor is the Hobgoblin Archer. So it's not affected by the darkness spell because it has dark vision. Uh, magical darkness is not opaque in Pathfinder 2E to dark, um, to dark vision creatures. And uh, so it can see everybody, everyone's observed to the archer and it's going to uh attack the wizard with its crossbow which has a great 120 foot range increment meanwhile the archer is undetected to the wizard so the wizard will be flat-footed to this attack so here we go it will not succeed oh no it will succeed 21 the um the because it was flat-footed, every plus one matters. So uh, the archer uh, is now going to roll damage, and it has a special monster ability. It does extra damage on its first uh, strike every turn, and 10 uh, piercing damage is modest. Okay, so it uses another action to reload. Oh, by the way, it made an attack. So normally it would reveal itself and become observed to everybody, but because it's in the darkness, it is only observed by the dwarf. And to the wizard, it is still hidden. And we uh, are it's gonna be flat-footed to this next attack. Plus 11. And this is, will be a miss. Okay. Okay, one important thing to note here is the darkness spell that the Necromancer cast was a third level spell. And spell levels are important for determining what trumps what else in Pathfinder. And um, the cleric, uh, its cantrip auto heightened to third level. Darkness su uh, suppresses a light spell of its level or lower. And furthermore, the darkness spell says it acts as a shroud and light does not enter the area of the darkness spell. So what's happened basically is an extinguishing, a suppressing of the light spell here. And so the entire room is dark to those creatures that rely on light. Okay, the rogue is next. And this rogue, they all know that this troll has attack of opportunity. We remember the rogue does not have dark vision and is therefore blinded right now. She would like to get over here and flank the troll, but uh, she can't quite, she'll have to use two actions to get there. And she would provoke an attack of opportunity from the troll while doing that. And uh, she's relatively squishy. The fighter is much tougher. So she's gonna delay until after the fighter. Well, the troll's up and the troll does not regenerate on this turn because it is uh, it just took fire damage within the last round. And it is also, um, uh, it is not affected by the darkness. However, it is dazzled this turn. So it's gonna have a uh, mischance when it's attacking the fighter. So with every single attack, there uh, is a 20% mischance. So I'm gonna roll these mischances first. The first most accurate attack is gonna miss for sure. And the subsequent attacks might hit. So what it will do, it would have opened with a claw attack. Uh, it has this special ability that incentivizes a double claw attack. And that 18 will miss and this natural 20 will hit. Um, and it's a critical hit. So it is going to do uh, a lot of claw damage to Valros. So 20 uh, damage to the fighter. That is... I said Valros. Okay. It now becomes the fighter's turn. And he is going to... Uh, he's blinded right now by the darkness spell. 
and so he's going to be moving at half speed. Uh, he's going to be doing that through trying to get to the other side of the troll. It's going to take him two actions to get there. He's wearing armor that slows him down to a 20 foot speed. So uh, he's going to walk through. However, um, that does provoke this attack of opportunity, and he's the one to take it. And the troll uh, is still dazzled, so it's going to roll this flat check and misses. So um, that has succeeded at protecting the fighter. So he spends two actions to go there, and he's going to use his last action to attack the troll. Um, and the troll is hidden to the fighter still. So uh, here's a flat check, and he misses. So it is now the rogue's turn, and the troll has already used its reaction, uh, so she doesn't have to worry about an attack of opportunity. So I'm going to walk through this scenario uh, if she had to worry about it. Uh, basically, she, wants, she would want to become hidden in order to make that attack less likely to succeed. And she is out in the open, uh, and the, they can see her perfectly fine in this darkness spell. And... So she normally would not be able to hide right now. She would have to create a diversion because she has no cover or concealment to use to hide with. Uh, but her um, creating a diversion, her skill for that, her deception skill is not as good as her high um, stealth skill. And so she actually will want to hide and can hide now because we remember this troll is uh, dazzled as a result of the Cleric's uh, Dazzling Flash spell. The Cleric's turn has not started yet, and it had a one round duration, the effect did. And so she, all creatures are concealed to the troll. So she can actually hide, uh, try to hide right now. So she would roll to roll stealth and uh, become hidden and then be able to walk up uh, with um, a 50-50 mischance being imposed on the troll. So uh, this is what she'll do instead. And I almost forgot that um, she and the troll are started their turn. Okay, zombies and skeletons have uh, unique variant abilities in Pathfinder 2e, and these zombies have a rotting aura. All living creatures that start their turn within 10 feet of it uh, are uh, take 1d6 damage as their wounds fester or open up, rip open. So the troll's actually going to take, took a d d6 of damage within that zombie's aura. And so did, so is Mauricio. So that's two damage to Mauricio. Okay, so the troll has no reaction. She's going to walk up um, at half speed because she is blinded by the darkness and attack the troll with a 50-50 mischance. However, the flanking now means it, it's not like 5e where it would cancel out her advantage. It um, makes the troll flat-footed. So it has a minus two penalty to AC. And if she hits, she will get her sneak attack damage if she can get this flat check. So let's see. Um, 12. And uh, she might hit. So she's going to roll her attack now. She uses her rapier. And a 17 total 32 is a success. The troll's flat-footed AC is 18. It is uh, not hard to hit, actually, while doing scary damage normally. So this is going to be a critical hit. And the rapier uh, weapons have uh, special traits in Pathfinder, and the rapier is distinguished for doing an extra d8 of damage on a crit. So this will be a... which is not doubled on a crit, by the way. That is 39 damage, and it is going... that was very devastating to the troll. Um, her sneak attack damage doubled as well. Okay, so the rogue has another attack, and it she might succeed again, um, and get her sneak attack damage again. Uh, she can score sneak attack damage more than once, but this second attack will fail because she is blinded by the darkness. Okay, the next turn is the cleric. So um, the 
cleric has dispel magic prepared today, so he will try to cancel out the spell. Um, it does not automatically succeed if it's a third level spell or lower. He will have to succeed on a counteract check, which is basically um, it's uh, to simplify it, oversimplify it. It's basically his casting ability versus the DC of the casting ability of the spellcaster. So it's going to be plus 12 versus his 23. And he needs a 23 on this uh, roll when he casts the spell magic. And that does not succeed. And so he will spend his hero point uh, that he got at the start of the session to re-roll a d20 roll. So here we go. Um, he will try again. And succeeds this time. He succeeds at um, dispelling the darkness spell. And that was a big problem for the party. And so he um, he alternatively could have tried to walk out and um, make his light spell emanate out here, but that would have still left the wizard, um, and uh, he thought this would be better. So with this last action, he would like to um, walk out here to see if he can uh, illuminate this uh, hiding archer somehow. Um, but as a dwarf, he, this is about as far as he can get. So he's going to go here. Next is the wizard, who um, would like to take out this uh, troll. And he only prepared Fireball once today. So um, I'm showing all of the exceptions to the rules. He has a once a day ability called Drain Bonded Item. And he's going to use that right now as a free action to get his one, one of his expended prepared spells back. And that will be Fireball and he would like to, to uh, finish off the troll with this and also negate its regeneration. So he is going to cast Fireball again. So uh, he wants to target it right here to include all of these enemies in the radius. All right, so they will now make their saving throws. And full animation in progress. Okay, so... Okay, the number to beat is 22. So Zombie Brute number two is in fire. And, okay, is going to fail on its roll. It will, oh, let's see what the damage is. It will take 25 damage. Then um, the troll succeeds on its roll. So it takes half, 12. But it has weakness 10 to fire, so it takes 22 damage and is almost knocked out. And it also has its regeneration suppressed. The Necromancer succeeds and will take 12 fire damage and is finally starting to lose real hit points. And the fighter fails his saving throw and takes the full 25. And Zombie Brute number one critically fails its saving throw and takes 50 damage and is uh, uh, almost destroyed. So um, we are now... Okay, that's the wizard's turn. And what the wizard will now do is um, move here to avoid that archer's arrows. The zombie will now move here and try to attack that fighter. Um, a natural 20 will critically hit the fighter and um, do the following damage. It will do 16 bludgeoning damage to it, to him. And there's a car alarm. And the zombie has the improved push uh, ability and will force the fighter, because it's a critical hit, to move 10 feet this way, which is actually this this much distance on a Pathfinder 2E battle mat. Um, if it had regularly succeeded, it would have pushed him five feet. Okay, well, the Necromancer um, um, is a Necromancer, and so we'll cast Harm, which is the counterpart of the heal spell, but instead of healing living creatures, it harms living creatures, while simultaneously healing undead creatures 
and it does this in a 30 foot radius to all creatures and it's in uh in that emanation and it being an emanation he can choose to exclude himself from it and so it will affect everyone in this area so uh pretty much in that area and including mercial so uh, it is a third level harm spell. Oh, there are three versions of harm. He's going to cast a three action version of it in order to affect a whole area. And it's going to do 10 damage to the living creatures. Uh, well, the zombie brutes will be healing 10 meanwhile. And this <laughs> troll is not going to appreciate what its master just did. So they will, uh, the rogue and the fighter will make fortitude saves. And the number to beat is 23. The, the troll succeeds and takes half damage, so five damage. And meanwhile, the fighter and the rogue both fail and take 10 negative damage each. Okay. So uh, that used all of the necromancer's actions, and so he's standing in place and Kona cannot move. The zombie brute is next and will try to protect its master. And that's its main command. And it is currently dazzled. So it will uh, now try to attack the fighter, but it has a flat check to make. It needs a five or higher on each of its attacks and it will attack two times, so I'm going to roll a second roll now. So these attacks will successfully target the fighter, and let's see if they, if they land. A 28 will hit, and the second attack will miss. So this will be another um, nine damage to the fighter, and he's being knocked about. He's going to be knocked. He's being pushed over here. And it is now the Hobgoblin Archer's turn, who sees the fighter threatening the f uh, uh, threatening the spellcaster. So it's going to, um, well, yeah, going to shoot the fighter, who currently seems to be benefiting from some cover. I'll give plus two to his AC. So now he's going to shoot the fighter. Um, or try to, who he can see perfectly, of course, with his, um, after reloading the crossbow, that 19 will fail. And then the archer will reload. The troll is next and will, uh, is no longer dazzled, by the way, and fails to regenerate this turn. And it will try to attack. Well, it just got stabbed really badly by the rogue, so I think it wants to go for the rogue. It's going to claw at the rogue. A 33 is going to hit the rogue. This is a um, going to do 18 slashing damage. And because it has the rend ability, if the second attack uh, hits, it will uh, do extra damage on its last action. 20 does not succeed against the rogue. Okay. Next is the fighter, and he could go after the necromancer, but he'd like to take some of these folks out of the battle. Uh, not this zombie brute, because it's in dim light. He will uh, try to move here so that he can get uh, two attacks off um, and try to hopefully take both of these out of the battle. But um, that means approaching at full speed and possibly taking this, getting hit by the troll. Well, on second thought, he's going to raise his shield and be conservative. He's only going to um, attack one of them. Yeah, he raises his shield as an action, walks forward, and hopes that the troll will miss him. So here comes its uh, jaw attack. And that is a hit, a uh, miss because of his shield. Every plus one matters. So, um, and he will now, um, he's now flanking the troll. He is going to try to hit it. And also that might've knocked him out if he had not raised the shield. Um, so this will be a 20, 
8, which um, it factors in. Foundry knows it's flanked. So, uh, yeah, that is going to be a regular success, and it will do 18 damage. So that takes it down to zero. Normally, a creature would be destroyed at this time, but it is a regenerating creature. Um, and non-player characters are destroyed uh, or killed. Um, but as a regenerating monster, uh, it is not dead yet. It take, gets the dying one condition because it was a regular success. A creature dies at dying four, and normally. Okay, next is the rogue, and she would like to take some folks out of the battle too. Um, she's gonna uh, attack the zombie brute since her low light vision uh, negates its advantage in dim light. And she will quick draw a dagger and throw it. And I learned today that thrown weapons do not benefit from doubling rings because they leave your hand. So I will use the regular stats of a dagger. And 22 will hit. The uh, zombies are not, are easy to hit. And oh, it does not do sneak attack damage actually. So that's going to be eight uh, piercing damage. Actually slashing damage uh, because uh, daggers are versatile weapons. My cat agrees. And yes, she does slashing piercing damage, which triggers its weakness uh, of 10 to slashing damage. So, um, uh, very good. With her next action, she's going to do uh, a rapier attack against that troll to help it along uh, on its path to its maker. So this is uh, gonna be a 27, which critically hits um, a troll that's unconscious, a creature that's unconscious, in addition to being flat-footed, gets a minus four penalty to AC. So that's a crit and lowers uh, or increases its dying value by two. So it's a dying three. With her last action, she's gonna quick draw again and uh, throw uh, at this zombie brute. Hopefully she'll hit this time. Um, and take it out. Oh, a one will not succeed. That would have been cool, though. Okay, the cleric is next, and um, he would like to do a three-action heal because that harms the undead, uh, but that would also bring this troll back up and bring it back to not dying anymore. And um, so he's just going to do the two-action version of heal and help the fighter along which, unlike the three-action version, heals additional uh, health. So he will, um, and he has the healing hands feet, so he gets to roll d10s. And that is 21 plus the bonus health from the two-action spell of 24. So that's 45 health uh, to the fighter. And... Uh, and then the next thing I'll do is try to get closer to that um, hobgoblin. And I believe he now is making the hobgoblin uh, dimly lit, revealing it to the party. Okay, the wizard as his first action. Um, he has no fire spells prepared, but he does have an alchemist's fire uh, in his pocket. He watched my video about uh, being prepared with alchemist alchemical items. So he's going to take that out and he's not trained um, with alchemical items. So he's only going to use his dex bonus to attack and it's a plus three. But um, he doesn't have to be very accurate while rolling a, uh, a bomb. 13 does not hit the troll which has an AC of 14, but it still does splash damage on a miss. And so he um, does one fire damage to the troll, and any damage that a creature takes increases their dying value. And so uh, it dies because it's fire damage, and it's a, it's a, it ignores the um, regeneration ability. Actually, it would have been 11 damage, but still... Um, it, that's a dead troll. 
That was his first and second actions. He had to take out the bomb. And the next thing he'll do is get closer to the action. He uh, A lot of spells in Pathfinder uh, require uh, have a 30-foot range. So he will uh, try to move behind this cover and get some protection against the archer. Next is this zombie brute, who I didn't remember before, but I remember now, uh, has a 10-foot reach. So the first thing it will do is try to attack the fighter and from here. And it's 28 will hit the fighter and do six damage. And the fighter has not used a reaction yet. So it will, uh, he will uh, use his shield block reaction to negate that damage entirely. His shield has a hardness of eight. He took a sturdy shield. However, it still succeeds at knocking it back beyond the zombie's range. So uh, the zombie will then uh, strike at the rogue and miss, who does nimble dodge, and the zombie misses. The necromancer is next, and he knows lightning bolt. So he will electrocute, try to electrocute these folks, and Let's uh, get that spell on the screen. And uh, he's going to roll 4d12 damage. Uh, ooh, that's a 23 electricity. Um, oh, by the way, he can see them fine. Um, it's an area effect spell, so he doesn't need to roll any targeting check on them. And he has no issue uh, uh, knowing where to aim it. Uh, where to place the area because of the light that's provided by the cleric. So uh, 23 electricity damage and they have to roll reflex saves and try to get a 23. And they both fail. They both take 23 electricity damage and this may knock out our rogue. So the rogue is going to go down and the rogue goes down to dying one, and the rogue goes to right before the effect that knocked her out in initiative. He um, casts Jump, which in Pathfinder is a first level spell, takes one action, which lets you jump anywhere within 30 feet. He's gonna jump up here <laughs> to this platform to the side uh, and get away, or try to get away. Okay, next is this zombie uh, who will uh, try to attack the fighter. And it is still dazzled. It's dazzled for a whole minute. So that is um, a possible hit. And the second attack will possibly hit. And here are its attack rolls. Fist number one. Uh, 26. Once again, his raised shield um, saves him. And... The second attack will not succeed. Okay, next is the Hobgoblin Archer, who will now, okay, now that the light's shining on him, he is observed by these two PCs. He is going to hide first and see if uh, he can become hidden to the fighter. And a 17 will not succeed, so uh, he doesn't know that, though. Uh, it's a secret roll. And he is now going to fire his crossbow at the fighter. And a 27 is going to hit. And that's my cat, Megan. That's uh, 15 damage with its special uh, crossbow precision ability. Then, as his last action, he will uh, try to hide again. and succeed. Okay, next round. The fighter is uh, no longer has his shield raised and he will, um, he's gonna move right here and then try to uh, kill this uh, zombie uh, and hopefully uh, succeed so that he can run for cover. And a 32 critically succeeds 
and he is going to give 18 damage, but the weakness to slashing means that the zombie is destroyed. And the fighter um, goes here for cover. Okay, the cleric is next and is within 30 feet of the rogue and would like to heal. Uh, Megan made a cameo, I see. Uh, try to heal the rogue, who... Uh, This uh, token's bugging. Uh, the rug actually doesn't have any health. So let's see. Um, uh, we'll heal her for a total of 43 health. And uh, so she loses the dying condition and she gains the wounded one condition, which means that in Pathfinder, you can't go up and down infinitely. Every time you get up from dying, you get the wounded condition, uh, or it increases by one. The next time you go down to zero hit points, you become dying one plus the value of the wounded condition. So it becomes increasingly perilous for you to get back up from zero. And you can even be critted, which takes you to dying two normally, and if you're wounded two, that kills you. Uh, Alright. The cleric is now uh, gonna, with his last action, move right here uh, behind that pillar. And it now becomes the wizard. So the wizard um, is going to cast a spell, um, cast electric, well, not electric arc. Uh, let's see, he has some cantrips and he is going to cast Ray of Frost because it has enough range against the zombie. And he has a spell attack roll of plus 12. And 27 will critically succeed and uh, do it's going to kill, it's going to destroy the zombie, and it does this times two. It does 28 damage to the zombie brute. Okay, with his last action, uh, he is going to mm, become undetected, try to become undetected. He's going to sneak. He's currently hidden to the enemies, so he's going to uh, try to sneak. I mean, he could cast uh, shield, but... He already is benefiting from cover. 22 is going to succeed. Um, he needed to beat a 22 on the part of both enemies. Okay. The rogue is now conscious, but when you get knocked out in Tui, you drop everything in your hands. She's going to spend her first action to pick up her rapier, her second action to stand up, and then she will dart here 25 feet and then up the stairs, which is difficult terrain. Um, she has a 35 foot speed. Then it's now the Necromancer. The Necromancer is, uh, see, sees they've disengaged and is going to, uh, cast Blur on himself. He has that spell. And what this does is it makes him concealed to all, uh, to all creatures. And, uh, however, it's written in the Blur spell itself that it cannot be used uh, for the hide action, to set up the hide action. Uh, the next thing he'll do is uh, move uh, behind his trusty m uh, minion. He's going to move right there. This artwork is a little deceiving. Maybe this uh, zo hobgoblin architecture is actually truly here behind uh, the base of the pillar. Okay. Next, the archer is going to uh, move over uh, since everyone left his line of sight, I believe. No, no, not the elf, um, which I will interpret the artwork as uh, being uh, still observed by him. And he has low light, and he uh, succeeded on his stealth roll earlier. 
So he is going to, he is hidden to the rogue. And so she is flat footed. Oh, however, she has deny advantage. And this is a level five archer. So she is not flat footed. And he will try to attack her with that crossbow. He reloads and then shoots. Um, ooh, 34 is a critical hit, and that's not good. And that is 26 damage. Um, thankfully, heal spells are pretty powerful, and she's still on her feet, 17 health. And the archer then reloads his weapon. Uh, the fighter is next, and is actually going to delay for after the wizard. Uh, the cleric is next, and has yet another heal spell, and he's going to help the fighter out. Ooh, that's good. 50 health is returned to the fighter. And then this cleric will uh, uh, creep here. He's currently uh, hidden to these enemies. Then the cleric uh, moves here. Um, yeah. Then the wizard. Meanwhile, um, he is undetected by them right now. And he's going to step here, which doesn't violate being undetected. Or the sneak action um, and, uh, from previously. And cast the third level heightened version of jump. On him. He has jump prepared as a heightened spell, and this is great. It's he gets to cast on someone else, unlike the first level version, and it's not for one jump, it lasts for a whole minute. So he can do the 30-foot jump in any direction, including up, as the leap action. Uh, with a single action. Okay, so the fighter on his turn is going to stow away his shield and with that free hand get the sling stone from the cleric that is glowing with the light spell and so he is going to be the source of light now and as his third action he will jump up and that will illuminate our enemies there okay next is the rogue who is does not have all those conditions one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One. So, um, because of Valros, uh, she is not able to see them, and she will move right here and hope to do something next turn. All right, so the Necromancer is next, and he wants to get away. Uh, he is going to, well, let's look at the light. So this is the edge of the light, and once he starts moving in here, he's going to be at half speed because he can't see in the dark. So, okay, so what we'll do, he's going to basically move half speed. He can move seven squares this way. So 35 feet, and he has the Featherfall spell prepared. And that means that he can land safely on his feet as reaction, it's reaction spell, and then uh, move to the square. And he knows that he probably is being observed right now by the cleric. Meanwhile, the, those who are not able to see in the dark or not have line of sight, uh, he will be hidden to them. Okay, the archer has a loaded crossbow, I believe, and will fire it at the rogue. And that is a 21 that will miss, and he will reload and fire, being the loyal minion he is. And miss. So the cleric, meanwhile, knows that he's the only one who's able to see this guy, and he will... Uh, get as close as he can so that he can possibly point out the necromancer later. And he will be able to walk faster than the necromancer. That's also in his advantage because the necromancer has to travel at half speed. The wizard, meanwhile, is 
has a, another trick up his sleeve. He is going to uh, walk here and cast Blindness on the Hobgoblin Archer. Blindness uh, will uh, impose the Blind condition, obviously. It also has the Incapacitation trait, so it is weaker against higher level creatures. It's a third level spell, and the enemy, if it is more than double the spell's level, such as a level 7 creature, would roll their saving throw and get a degree of success better against the effect. So spells that incapacitate, um, hence the name, or do a pretty much shut down a creature, do something pretty drastic against higher level creatures are significantly weaker. So it's part of the balancing of the system. So this uh, wizard casts blindness and the archer will now make a saving throw. Mm, 23 succeeds. So uh, according to the blindness spell, he is blinded until his next turn begins. So the fighter is next and is about to do violence. So the fighter will uh, charge forward and uh, that was two actions. And with his last action, he will swing his sword, obviously. And that is not a hit. Okay. Uh, our rogue now can easily go walk over and flank. However, I am teaching the rules. So let's assume the fighter um, did something catastrophic and tripped on this little rock in the artwork and is over here instead. Um, well, the rogue is now in plain sight and has no cover and would appear to have no options to get sneak attack and make this enemy flat-footed. Uh, but she uh, can create a diversion uh, by um, doing something distracting. She is... Uh, hmm. She's going to do a gesture uh, because she's not sure she shares a language with the archer. And she is going to do a deception check against its perception DC. 24 uh, beats the 22. So she is now hidden to the archer. She couldn't uh, sneak over um, and stay hidden because there's no cover or concealment to end up in, to finish the sneak action in. So she's just going to step, which according to create a diversion does not end the condition and then now she will make her attack and the hobgoblin is flat-footed and she attacks with a rapier and that is going to be a 25 and she gets her sneak attack damage so this shows ooh, a lot of sneak attack i mean a lot of damage and so this shows how you can sneak up to an enemy in pathfinder 2e Next is the necromancer, who is being directly observed by this cleric, who realizes that this cleric can see him perfectly well, so he will cast the invisibility spell. And this will make him hidden uh, to the dwarf. And now that he is invisible, he will sneak away. And because the dwarf has no way of seeing an invisible creature, he does not, well, yeah, he does not, if he can succeed on this sneak, let's see if he does. Mm, okay, he does not have a very good stealth score, but oh, <laughs> if he were to roll a 20, I was about to say. Um, so this is, uh, the cleric's DC is 24. So instead of a failure, it becomes a regular success, one step up. He succeeds therefore on his sneak check. So he, he becomes undetected during and at the end of his movement. And so once he's undetected, because this, because the dwarf has no way of seeing him directly because of the invisibility, it doesn't matter whether he ends in cover or not. He stays undetected as long as his role is successful. And it was in this case. So the dwarf now does not know what square the necromancer's in. The hobgoblin archer is next, and being the loyal minion he is, he is going to reload and then uh, fire at the rogue, and that is a critical hit. Uh-oh. Let's see here. Might knock her out again. 
Uh, that's 24 damage, and it does knock her out again. That health bar is a lie, and she goes straight, oh, to dying three. That is not good because of the wounded one condition. Thankfully, she has a hero point uh, and can probably um, stabilize through heroic recovery. Uh, but the next thing that Archer does is reload uh, to go after that fighter. Okay, next is the cleric, and they have a plan. So they would like to go, they don't want that necromancer to get away, but they need light. So they're going to delay and uh, wait for the fighter to stand up from his fall. And he's going to uh, jump down um, using his uh, magical leap ability and then uh, jump forward um, again, 30 feet. Here we go. Probably right there. Um, and uh, illuminate the area. Okay, and then next would be the cleric who would, um, who is much better at perceiving things. He's going to move forward and he is going to try to perceive this 30 foot cone uh, in front of him and he will um, seek. He'll do the seek action. So any undetected enemy will be upgraded if he succeeds. So here we go. Perception. He needs to be the 13. <laughs> um, the DC of this necromancer's stealth. 29 is a critical success. Now, normally that would make the um, creatures you critically succeed against observed to you, but because the guy's invisible, it is limited to uh, being uh, raising it to hidden. A regular success raises them by one step and critical success makes them observed no matter what under normal circumstances, um, if that makes sense. So uh, with his third action, he then points out the necromancer to his allies who can see where he's pointing. And thanks to the light that's there provided by the fighter, uh, the wizard and the fighter can see where he's pointing. So the necromancer now becomes hidden to these two allies. Next, the wizard, uh, and he has a spell for this occasion. Um, he wants to cast Acid Arrow. And, okay, first of all, step by step, the Necromancer is hidden uh, to the wizard. The fact that the Necromancer has Blur is not relevant right now because that's um, being... Um, hidden um, does not stack with being concealed. It's the stronger effect. Uh, so the wizard would have a 50-50 chance to hit with this acid arrow, which calls for an attack roll. But the wizard also has the spell True Strike, a level one spell, which is one action, which he can cast now. And what True Strike does, it's a fortune effect and so it's like advantage in 5e. It lets him roll the attack roll twice. But on top of that, True Strike lets him ignore the flat check to target a creature caused by the concealed condition or hidden condition. So he doesn't need to roll the flat check at all because he knows exactly what square the necromancer's in. So. He rolls the flat check. No, sorry. He does not roll the flat check. He just goes straight to the attack roll. And he gets to roll twice on this attack. Here we go. Uh, 23 and 31. And not quite a crit, but that is a hit. So he now, he now takes 3d8 acid damage from acid arrow so 11 acid damage and he also takes persistent uh 1d6 persistent acid damage as well uh so at the end of each of his turns he's going to take this damage and after taking the damage he gets a flat check needs a 15 or higher uh to end the persistent damage so that's i believe everything i wanted to show um 
Will our heroes succeed at defeating the Necromancer? Will we get away with the invisibility spell? Uh, this uh, tunnel actually continues beyond the, the edge of the picture, so he could get away. Maybe the acid arrow will do him in, so who knows what will happen. Uh, in the meantime, I believe I've shown everything I wanted to show. Um, the the various conditions in action, how various spells interact with those rules, uh, the sneak action, create a diversion, seek, point out, hide, and uh, I hope that was helpful. So I hope that rules explanation and combat demonstration were helpful in improving your game, whichever game you play, whether it's Pathfinder 2e or D&D 5th edition. And uh, I like to hear what you think about the con in the comments. Do you have other suggestions or there things I said wrong? Uh, if you enjoyed this format of uh, me going over uh, a set of rules and explaining them also via a combat demonstration, uh, definitely let me know if there are specific rules areas that you'd like me to go over uh, that you think could be served well by this format within either Pathfinder 2e or D&D or other systems that I've played, uh, including Starfinder, Pathfinder First Edition, uh, let me know in the comments. You should also subscribe to my channel if you like my content. I already have a video up on five things that D&D could incorporate in their next edition from Pathfinder. I plan to do a more in-depth video uh, soon, quite soon. And I also have other video that explains more uh, rules from Pathfinder 2e and teaches the system. So you may want to check that out. I uh, have a great Discord community where people talk about 5e, Pathfinder 2e, and also play uh, in a shared campaign. And also my Patreon. I want to thank all my patrons for their generous support that uh, make this channel possible. And I encourage all of you who want to support me to check out that page. So the links to all of these things are in the description. And I want to thank you all for watching. And I will see you next time.